Welcome back, everybody, to the Doc Talk podcast, proudly produced in partnership with the Ottawa Rowing Club. I'm your host, Zach Lewis, and I started this podcast with the goal of fostering the community that surrounds our sport of rowing. I hope to do this through a variety of concise and insightful conversations with individuals from all over the rowing world. Rowers, coaches, and practitioners of the sport, both past and present, will share their knowledge and stories with us with the goal of educating, inspiring, and motivating our listeners. Now, I am beyond thrilled to share today's guest with you. Following a brief stint as the coxie of the Australian Men's Eight and the 1979 World Championship, today's guest transitioned fairly easily into the world of coaching where he saw an illustrious and successful career. Working his way up through the ranks, his crew saw success at the schoolboy, club, national, and international levels, where in the highest level of competition, a number of crews under his tutelage went on to win dozens of world championship and Olympic medals. He most famously supported consistent world-class performances with Australia's Orsum Forsum throughout the mid and late 90s, was then head coach of Australia's most successful Olympic rowing team at the time in the Athens Olympics. After the London 2012 Games, his coach decided he was looking for a new challenge, which brought him to cross the Tasman Sea and assume the coaching role of the infamous Kiwi Pair and then eventually take over the entire suite program for Team New Zealand, including the Kiwi Men's 8. He now resides as the High Performance Director for the State of Victoria Rowing in Australia and is the Chair of the National Selection Committee for all age groups. It is my pleasure today to welcome one of the most successful living international rowing coaches to the show, Noel Donaldson. Welcome, Noel, and thanks for joining us today. Where are you coming to us from? I'm coming to, to you from Melbourne, Australia, or even more specifically, Port Melbourne, where I live. So. Perfect. And that's where you're at with uh, just working your day off or team training or what? Yeah, it's a bit of a sleep in morning, but uh, when we finish, I'll head off. We've got an under-23 uh, national aspirants trialling. They want to change the seating in their boat, so that'll keep me out of mischief for some some of the morning. But luckily, not far away. Our offices and the, the river are only about 4K from home, so um, I'm blessed with not having to face uh, big city traffic. Nice. And can you tell our listeners a little bit about what your role is currently with Rowing Australia? Yeah, well, uh, well, uh, as from the Rowing Australia point of view, being the head coach in Victoria means I'm Rowing Australia's agent, but primarily my work is all through Victoria. Um, we have our athletes who are aligned to the Victorian Institute of Sport on individual scholarships, and Rowing Victoria um, picks up the brief for just about all, all matters associated with rowing in our state of Victoria. Uh, and I run the high performance uh, arm of that. So as head coach of Rowing Victoria and also the chair of selectors, which I mean I have to select the uh, state teams, uh, in, in including our masters athletes um, as well. So it's a very multifaceted role in a smallish organisation. Awesome. So each uh, state across Australia has its own institute of sport, its own performance director, its own head coach, and those kind of all feed into Rowing Australia as a whole? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, they, uh, they they refer to us as state leads, and um, the model is different in some places. Um, New South Wales, the biggest state, don't specifically have a head coach, so they use some program managers to fulfil that role, and they have club, uh, big club head coaches that sort of participate in some of the planning activities as well. As we have a, uh, two high performance clubs here in Melbourne as well, and, and they're sort of aligned along with me in what we do here in Victoria. But yeah, you, you've hit it on the, on the head. Each state has a uh, representative through their state association or institute uh, linking back to Rowing Australia. Fantastic. Now, I always try and start uh, by asking our guests how they got involved with the sport of rowing in the first place. Uh, we kind of bring in people from the show from a variety of different rowing backgrounds and different geographic areas. Can you tell us in a couple sentences how you got involved in the sport, kind of how you got sucked in and how you're still here however many years later? Yeah, well, there's a little bit of it played in North America, in Canada, because I've actually been to a game of cricket in uh, in Canada, probably around 99 or somewhere around there when the Worlds were there. Uh, I played cricket as a young kid at school. Uh, I wasn't very good at it. I still dream of one day being a spin bowler, but wasn't very good at it. <laughs> and um, there's a little bit of history in our family with rowing. My brother had, had coxed. He's a year older, and he got my grandfather had rowed into collegiate and and so it was, a, it was a good option as another sport at school. So I, I took that up in what is our year eight. So I would have been about 12, 13 or something years of age, Kerry Grammar School, uh, and stayed with it all the way through. You know, Cox the first crew and then you end up, you know, club, state, national programs and those sort of things. So that's how, how I got involved. And 
you know, I'll sing the praises of coxswains, you know, they're the, the heart and soul of the sport and we know more than everybody else and tell people of what course. to do. But but that's 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 how I got it. Not fell into it, but, you know, it was an opportunity of a school sport and uh, I really enjoyed it. It was outdoor, on the water. There's a whole heap of synergies there that, that I enjoyed and you know, a lot of fun early on and then you got a bit more serious and, you know, tried to win rowing races and that sort of stuff. So uh, pretty simple beginning. And you went fairly quickly from starting coxing at grammar school to ending up with the senior team after some some King's Cup races. And then from what I understand, it was one season, 1979, Aussie Men's Aid at Worlds, and came home and f- transitioned fairly quickly into coaching, going back to grammar school, I believe, before working with Mercantile and then eventually the, the state crews, correct? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I've done um, – our schools here run fairly big programs and so they're always looking for people to coach their younger kids particularly. So yep. the first year out of school for me was 1974 and uh, I think I coached the sixth eight or something at the school and, um, you know, just putting back into that there too. But once I'd been in the national team, it was quite hard when I came through coxing because we didn't row a lot of um, – other boats, you know, pairs and coxless boats and whatever. And because you came through coxing crews and club eights and state eights and those sort of things, we, we generally in each state and each club had lots of good coxswain. So you mm-hmm. had to be damn good to even get one go, let alone get uh, multiple goes. So I, I, I narrowly missed out on the 1980 Olympic crew. Um, yep. And then it gave me a bit of a segue to, you know, just, just spread over to uh, – in, in, into coaching. I, I – for want of a better word, made a comeback a couple of years later um, with some of the older guys as well too, um, found we're probably over the hill. Um, and uh, and the coaching started to flourish more and more and I really I really enjoyed it as well there too. So, yeah, pretty pretty much that was the segue from, you know, one opportunity to represent the country and, uh, and then get into some more meaningful coaching by then. Do you think that it's – more challenging for coxies now or uh i guess a couple decades ago because we're seeing same same sort of challenges now where we have senior team coxies or even under 23 or collegiate coxies that are working predominantly in that eight coxed four setting but the world seems to have shifted a lot more into being able to break down those big boats into straight fours coxed fours coxes pairs i think there's a whole lot more um coaching almost that goes into the coxie role now at that high performance level than it once was but I've never been a coxie, and I, I guess I defer to your insight on that one, having been a coach and a coxie. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right because, um, you know, every day I went to training when I was young, you jumped in an eight and steered it up and down the river. And um, and now these days it's almost in our environment, it's few and far between. Um, even within our training centres, the coxswains aren't full-time athletes because they're in their smaller boats Um uh, so, so often and then towards this time of the year they start to get a lot more actively involved and then the team selected and then they're full-time time with it. And so you're looking for other things for the coxswains to do. Otherwise, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're off doing other things. They're not learning and the like. So we try and put them out into coaching roles or the shadowing roles and do a lot of education with them. So the few opportunities they do get, they can hopefully do a really, really good job for it. And and of course, there's lesser boats these days. You know, there's no lightweight eight at the World Championships, and yeah. there's min- minimal opportunities for them. And of course, then there's gender. So uh, you know, gender neutral now means you've got to be really, really good because not only you've got to be better than the other sex as well too to be able to uh, ensure that you get a spot in a crew. As we see, there's probably a slightly higher percentage of young ladies coxing men's boats and the other way around. Um, so, yeah, it, it's pretty precious to get a spot uh, in, a, in a key uh, rowing boat coxing these days. Yeah, absolutely. Are our, uh, our senior team coxies in Australia considered fully carded or fully scholarshiped? Yeah, the, 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 they are. Of course, that will depend, of course, how the crew goes, you know. So um, our men's eight, for example, won a medal, so that's a higher level than our women's eight. And... And the coxswain will receive the same uh, benefits um, according to the result of the actual crew. Gotcha. But but they they don't necessarily live in the training centres all the time, uh, depending on how they uh, the head coaches of those centres want to run their program. So um, uh, yeah, it's it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting lifestyle for them. You know, from perhaps say a US college program where 
there would be a you know, higher propensity to, for them to be training in eights and the coxswain yep. obviously integrally, integrally involved. Yep, understood. Now, as you already alluded to, coxies know everything. Um, of they course. have the eyes and ears of the boat. Now, being a former coxswain, I feel like there's a distinct set of advantages that goes into transitioning to the coaching side of the dock and perhaps some disadvantages as well. Um, typically, coxies have a great read on athletes, uh, tactical background, strong communication skills, and can really see and feel what's going on in the boat from a non-rower perspective. Um, however, many former coxies that transition to coaching don't necessarily come from high rowing seat backgrounds. Like they're, they're not usually the ones with the oar in hands, obviously from a coxie role. Um, and then would, do you think this would translate to somebody having a lacking in technical feel or, or uh, I guess just a feel aspect to their coaching repertoire? I think you can make a generalization of that, but I don't know that it necessarily holds for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. My background was I played a lot of other sport and I played a lot of Australian rules football um, yep. as well. So I'd like to think that the physical side of sport I understood really, really well, you know, I knew how to hurt myself and, you know, when you're there yelling and screaming at them saying row harder, um, you know, at least I knew I'd been in that territory in other activities before. Um, because we probably had more coxswains around in those days, we used to row a fair bit ourselves. We'd either be out sculling or... Oh, um, nice. And, and and I sailed as a, as a young kid. So that's wind on the water, reading a boat in, in water and those sort of things. So that's fortunate opportunity, right place, right time. Um, and not everybody necessarily gets that. So... Um, and I think you could put two coxswains in the same seat and each would come up, come up with a different set of feel, you know, what they think the actual boat's actually doing at that particular time. So yep. ultimately, if you're going to survive at the top, though, you know, you've got to have a really good innate understanding of you know, what the boat's doing, let alone the man management, the communication, those sort of things there that go along with it as well there too. So I don't think because you do all those other things, you're necessarily better, but I do think it uh, will hold you potentially in better stead if you have a, a, a more wide skill array of being physical, of you know, being um, a bit more confident about the actual movement because you can do it yourself. You know? Absolutely. What do you think some of your uh, personal biggest assets were coming to coaching from the Coxie seat? Um, I, I think I, well, in fact, in fact, actually, I think probably if I was coxing now, I, that's a bit impossible at my weight. Um, <laughs> you know, you, 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 you sort of have good feel. So you think, well, I must have had reasonable feel, even though my rowers at times got, you know, the high level ones got stuck into me about not being very competent. But, um, and, and you learn, you learn by that, you know, when they criticize you and go, well, what, why aren't I? able to impress them and do the things they actually want to do. So, you know, I was, I was pretty keen about learning and getting better, uh, mm -hmm. not making mistakes, uh, you know, that I might have made previously and the like. So it was about good feel. It was about being able to train well but also race well. There's some cops in there that have a, you know, affinity in training. They can, you know, sort of pick things there, but they under pressure in a big race may not sort of do it. And there are others that are, great races, you know, maybe a little lazy for want of a better word in training, but sort of really raise the bar and energetic in, in racing. So I, I think you've got to be aware of all all skill sets from that sort of point of view. But I was probably somewhere in the middle of all of that and um, and, and had a keen desire, you know. It was not win at all costs or anything like that there too, but I always wanted my boats to go as well as they can. And I think that's probably, I suppose every coxswain would say, say that, but You'd hope you know, anyway. it, was, it was a it was a real passion in one sense about what what's my role to make this actually go better. You know, if I can contribute towards it, because I had some good mentors as well. You know, who who impressed upon us and gave us the self confidence that if you cox really well, you'll make a difference. You know, so the difference between them winning or losing by canvas or whatever it might be may well be the way how how will you perform. So you think, gee, I better better be pretty good at that. So that was pretty good, I think, from a coaching point of view. You're always looking for ways and means to make sure your crew, your boat, could actually perform as well as it possibly could. So so from that point of view, I, I think I was, you know, again, as I said, right place, right time and fortunate to work with some really, really good people and then had a passion to want to coach as well. And and I was a, I was a, it was a second career for me going into school teaching physical education, sports science, that sort of thing. I've been in the hospitality industry. I described myself as an alcoholic probably before. Uh, it's not <laughs> fun though. And um, 
So I, I made a, a choice when an offer was given me to work at my old school you know, full time as a physical education teacher. So once you're also in front of people all day long, you know your skill is telling them what to do, how to do it, where to do it. Um, then th- that that helped contri- contribute a lot towards my coaching as well too. You know, you're almost twenty four seven instructing people in a sporting sense. You know how to perform an activity better. You know, and my specific activity was rowing, but. But you know, when you're teaching, of course, you're teaching a whole heap of different sports as well there too. So you're picking up you know, tricks of the trade and, and broadening your horizons all the time. Absolutely. I mean, and you obviously found the perfect storm of the right people, the right support and the right instruction because several times during your career, your crews did come out on top, whether it was by a canvas or by more. And uh, I mean, particularly if you look from the early to mid 90s right through until the Sydney Olympics, there was an exceptional amount of uh of rowing success that came out of Australia and some of the crews that were working with you. Now we have, we touched a little bit on the state system. Um, and one of the big things in Australia is the Kings and the Queens cup. So the, the top eights from each of the States that face off at Aussie nationals every year. Um, and I've talked about this on the show with a couple of other guests before, but during the nineties, you had eight or nine crews that went on to win, uh, out of the 10 that you entered during that decade on the men's side. Anyways, what was the, I guess the catalyst for that, was it just an exceptional group of athletes? I mean, not to toot your own horn, I'm sure you were a fantastic coach with them as well, but what do you think uh, kind of fed into that exceptional level of rowing in the oarsmen that you worked with? Well, I think you almost answered the question yourself. I've had a lot of people say, you know, what does it take to be a good coach, you know, and how come you've been so successful? I said, good athletes, you know, great (laughs) athletes. Pretty easy. To, it's easier to coach great athletes. I mean, they bring a bigger challenges, of course, there too, and the the margins are narrower. You know, at the really, really top end. But um, yeah, we had some really uh, great athletes all through that era. Um, I, I'd coached a couple of them at school and that sort of thing. So therefore, um, you know, you had some role right from the very beginning, and uh, lots of my my mates still today who were coaching in other schools and well there too. So the majority of those athletes were all well schooled in their school programs. Um, a lot of them came to Mercantile Rowing Club, sort of a, yep. around that era, probably a higher percentage of them. Um, we had a good uh, plan in place there for them through junior, under 23, senior. So, you know, they're, they're, they're in a good good place to be able to progress really well. And, and we just had a, a pretty good crop. And once you get a good crop, if you can then, you, you'll always lose one. But, you know, we didn't have to re-recruit a whole group of people. We just had to get a new one that came in. And that was, say, the, the Drew Ginn story, you know, some, a younger person coming in. So we were always feeding it. And then you know, sort of post that generation there, there were a whole heap of other good guys that represent Australia several times came through as well too. So, we, yeah, we, we'd had a, a golden era sort of through that period there. Um, one of the ones we did lose was when the Australian Institute of Sport rode for the ACTs, the Australian Capital Territory, which is regarded as a state um, per se. So we thought that was cheating at the time, but um, we came third anyway, so it wouldn't have mattered that much uh, uh, I- I- anyway. But no, it was, it was, but it was a good springboard for those guys. Uh, they love rowing for their state, and the history and tradition of that carries on through the current teams. You know, at the moment. We, every year we try and win those races again. Um, we did it two years ago. We've got a good chance of doing it again this particular year. Um, we've won the girls so many times now it's not funny um, and they're so sort of dedicated towards it and we've got a great group of guys this year as well. So um, you know, when they pull on the big navy blue, I've got it even here, Zach, if you can see it, look at that there. Yeah, the big white V. It's like you grow a third leg, we say, and um, so there's a lot of spirit associated with that, and um, as there is in in other um, uh, states in some sort of boat classes, certainly New South Wales in the in the men's eight, you know, they have a real pride and have for a long time, and trying to sort of knock off our records and that sort of side of things. So it's it's a it's a healthy part of Australian uh, rowing, but but it's actually only one day of the year, so to speak. So um, and that's coming up soon, right? In a month or so. Yeah, yeah, it's only about four or five weeks away at the most. So um, we're in the throes of communicating. A lot of our best athletes are in the men's and women's training centres, so we've been communicating with them about, uh, you know, what our plans are and when they'll be back and when we go to Perth and how we train and those sort of things. Gotcha. Well, good luck to you and your crew so you get ready for that for that next little month or so. That's got to be a fun way to kick off. Here. That kind of That's the accumulation or culmination, sorry, of your domestic season and kind of kicks off your international season, right? 
because it's pretty much yeah yeah was, yeah. As soon as that race is over, uh, they head home, and within a day or so, they're then in their full time training in the national team. So uh, yeah. Uh, both uh, and this year with the under twenty threes as well, they'll be on that um, on on that uh, same time span. And we're actually sending a couple of crews to Windermere Cup as well too this year. Uh, oh, fun! Men's, men's and women's eights, and they'll all start around the same time. Awesome. So yeah, there'll be a fair bit of activity as soon as the interstate regatta is over. Now, you also talked a little bit about your time at Mercantile um, when you had all these crews that were not only kicking butt at the King's Cup, but you had a number of them that went on to kind of race for Australia. Uh, a lot of these, well, several of these athletes were part of the various iterations of the Orsum Forsum, which is something that I think a lot of North American rowing fans or participants haven't a clue about how big they were, how much of a, of a kind of, how iconic they were in Australia, New Zealand, and, and in the world rowing. Could you briefly touch on who they were and, and what the uh, fandom was around them? Well, I, we can actually now say that it was in the last century, you know, so um, True. it's a while ago. And a lot of people introduce you and say, this is Noel and he cuts the awesome force. I mean, you go, the kid wasn't born. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it would only be if mum, dad, or they're passionate rowing people where they actually find. So, but in some days, the legacies sort of slow slow down. But it, it was an era. The history in Australia was primarily that they would select an eight as the pr- pr- premier boat to represent overseas. Yep. And um, a lot of those guys had rowed in the '88 Olympic crew. They some of them had been in the '86. Gold medal eights. The only time Australia's won the eights was in 1986, and then they didn't do as well in okay, fourth in 87, and then um, fifth in uh, 88. Had a break in 89, and then came back and said, "Look, we we could do something different here." And uh, the, some of their success was about their confidence. You know, you could say ego or however you want to couch that, but it was a little bit of, "Well, why don't we row a four? Mm-hmm. And then we don't have to f- pull four slow blokes along, sort of thing. You know, that was a bit of the the ego in it. Yeah. So we actually spoke with the Australian selectors and said, "Look, this group of guys who are the best in the country would like to row a four. We want you to consider that as an option um, to do that." And so they sort of said, "Okay, if you do this, you do that." Then you know, we certainly would would encourage it. And um, we had a little bit of battle getting it over the line because. Um, you know, they probably went back to a little bit of old thinking and tradition there for a little while, but then they gave us a green light and um, sent us away overseas. And at that stage, Cox's rowing wasn't something that was done a lot of as well too. So they said, right, why don't you go to, in those days, it was just a European regatta two days in Rachiche, yep. uh, in Czech Republic, and we rode Cox 4 one day and we rode Cox's 4 the next day. And the Cox 4... We borrowed a boat from, I think it might have been East Germans or something at the time. It was actually a wee bit small for us. It was quite rough. And um, we sort of got away a bit slowly, but we were coming through. We would have probably won the race if um, we didn't crab. Um, <laughs> Nick, Nick Green, and he's still got a funny nickname to this day as a result of it. And... Um, and so uh, by being beaten, that's that's what the end result is. And then the next day we won the Coxes for. So then that was a, the selectors meeting and um, and then they said, well, right, in Lucerne, uh, row the Coxes for. And so we rode the Coxes for and we won it. And that, at that time it was world best time and, 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 and away we went, so to speak, there too. And it sort of got some momentum and the awesome foursome sort of tag came as a result. It was a Melbourne-based journalist, Bruce Eva, we had a very, very good 4 by 100 swimming relay team called the Mean Machine. Mm-hmm. And they said the awesome in those days, it was AWE, as in, you know, they're good, uh, could be rowing's equivalent to the Mean Machine. And that's how it started. And then it, it picked up the rowing version of OAR. So, um, so that's sort of how that all sort of kicked off. And we won the world champs, which were in Tasmania later that year. So it was, it was sort of off and running. But not only were they talented people, but they sort of were, most of pretty tall guys. Um, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd all come through, pretty much all of them rode in what we call the loser's final. We're not allowed to use those words in today's PC word. <laughs> at, the, at, the, um, at, at our head of the river, yeah, they, they pretty much came through the loser's final at the head of the river and um, 
probably was a spur for them when they went into club rowing. You know, that school rowing wasn't as successful. We loved the sport and we wanted to actually be good at it. So they ended up, as I said, you know, through that 86 period being part of that. Uh, they had a, a bit of schooling at the AIS um, on scholarship, most of them at that stage there with Ryan Holbarchi. Uh, and he sort of uh, knocked him into shape, for want of a better word. He was a gruff, tough Romanian and uh, you know, was a wonderful uh, person within our program at that sort of time. So there were a lot of really, really positive things about their overall general development um, that sort of culminated in the opportunity to race the four and then the four having some wins and then winning back-to-back in 91. So you knew at that stage, well, gee, the next step's the Olympic Games, so that happened. And well, then they were getting to mid-late 20s and – you're sort of balancing out other things in life and that sort of stuff. So it took a little bit of a while to get going in the next Olympic cycle and um, we had the best fifth you could ever have in the world in 95. <laughs> um, yeah, we are pretty confident about how that went that it wouldn't take much that we could win again in 96. So um, uh, people, yeah, if you weren't associated with the crew in 95, you wouldn't have known what the steps that we made there that basically cemented the opportunity to um, – to win in 96 and Andrew Cooper went out, Drew came in and that probably freshened the boat up a little bit as well Well, there too. And, and then, as you said, remnants of it sort of continued to play vital roles. Well, it might have been then, then the pair or, you know, Mike was in the eight and those sort of things there too. So they continued to play a fairly big um, role in it and very proud of the uh, 2000, uh, 2001 Tokyo Olympians when both fours won, you know, that the uh, – like a hand over some, some of the prettiest rowing you'll ever see. Men's yeah. and women's crews, both of them, just stellar, stellar on water uh, experiences. Yeah, so so that that was um, I think a good Philip. You know, some you, you can take the attitude of bugger, someone's beaten our record or whatever, or you can really embrace it, and they certainly embrace it because uh, taking it away from the Brits, of course, is probably the best thing associated with that anyway. So, <laughs> um, and uh, ho- hopefully, they can continue to do it. Of course, yeah. And you briefly touched on 2000. So Sydney Olympics, you are head coach of the Australian crew at this point. What's it like coaching or getting ready with an Olympic program for a home Olympics? Yeah, I was actually a crew coach. I took over as being a men's head coach after, straight after the Olympic Games. Okay. Um, we sort of had a period of time. Um, in, in, go back to 1995. We struggled in 95, not, not so much our crew there, but – we had some leadership issues um, in the sport, and '96 we rebounded really well. Uh, Paul Thompson, who is now the current performance director, who doesn't need much introduction at a world level, um, you know, he was integral in that. Reinhold was uh, Tim McLaren, who's um, obviously worked in the USA as well. There was a group of us there that banded really together and sort of um, helped Australian rowing. We had a wonderful '96, not just the four, but you know, several other boats did really well at the same time. And then we sort of limped our way through a little bit sort of through the next cycle to 2000 and, um, you know, we had some consolidated leadership sort of at RA and things became a bit more professional and, and those sort of things there too. But, um, yeah, we, we we probably didn't quite have the leader to take us all through. It was sort of done in a more you know, sort of a overall structured way. Ryan Holt was actually the head coach of the, the team, as he often had been in the past, you know, even if he was was or wasn't coaching a crew, he, he would often be the, the key lead at major international events and particularly the Olympic Games events. So, um, gotcha. Uh, but he, he sort of started to slow down after that and he, he – um, uh, stepped aside for want of a better word and uh, Harold Yarling and myself sort of took over the men and the women and um, then I took over as performance director in 2004. But, but there was f- certainly a buzz of home Olympics. There, there was nothing sort of greater than that. Um, we, we had our challenges because Drew Ginn, who rode with James Tompkins in 99 in St Catharines and they'd won quite easily and then he hurt his back and he came back to row a Vienna World Cup and we won but then in Lucerne, we had to replace him. He'd, he'd rode a kilometre to the start and came back in and said, I can't, I can't race. So we put the spear in and um, the spear Matt Long rode with James Tompkins and then they won heat semi and final there and they were the pair and ended up with the bronze in, in Sydney. So it was a uh, challenging year but sort of a really rewarding year to do it all at home, you know, given those circumstances as well. Absolutely. And that pair race was something for the ages that french pair that went well it looks like they go about 250 meters early and then realize it with 
red buoys around them that there's still 250 to go and what a comeback from the field. I remember, yeah, yeah. I remember growing up row and watching that and that was one of the, the best races. It's a great um, example of you know, what can be done in sport there too. And also like for us uh, and even for me as a coach, you know, we – James was the more experienced over than Matt and we were always slow starters, you know, and we sort of had this thing, if we started any uh, faster, we might pull the thing apart, you know. And in the, the end, of course, you, you all know the rules of a final. Everybody's got a bit more life about them and so that there's more, more pace in the race and before you know it, we're off the pace, you know, in the race and we'd won our semi final. So uh, you know, I think if you ask James, he'll tell the same story. He said, with 500 to go, he said, there's no way I'm not going to get a medal, you know, but... By that stage there, the French would, you know, just just Four, gone. So, up, so yeah. there's, if you sort of knew, if you knew the stories and the people involved and all of that, you know, some of the other athletes and coaches involved there too, there was a quite a whole story to the entire race from go to woe, not just the way the French, you know, performed particularly at the end there too, and mm -hmm. you know some disappointments and some, you know, for us, you know, at least we got some reward out of it there too. But uh, yeah. When you when you get that far in front and you can hang on, then um, good luck to him. You know, so no kidding. Now he's, leading, now, now he's leading the organisation, John Christoph. So, yep, yeah, a good story, a really good sporting story. Now, jumping ahead in your career a little bit, um, you stay with Rowing Australia through a variety of roles right up until London, uh, and then you, for lack of a better term, jump ship, leave Rowing Australia, head to New Zealand, and take on the challenge of then working with. Bond and Murray, who've been undefeated for however many years at this point, uh, three, four years probably. What goes through a coach's mind when you see a crew like that that is on top of the world and has set records for most consecutive races won by a men's crew? And you think, yep, I can make them better. It seems almost like a no-win situation. Like if they win, it was Tonks that made them fast. If they lose, it's on your head. What, what uh, made you jump on that challenge? Well, I'd, because I'd coached James Tompkins at school, um, so we'd get, gone back and know, knew his family and all those things there, and he's a bit of a cheeky young fella and uh, old fellow now, he would have reminded me in a semi-humorous way um, on many an occasions, of course, if we win, it's because we're good, and if we lose, it's your fault. <laughs> and so I'd, I'd already lived a life of, um, you know, that sort of pressure, you know, in terms of what role a coach plays and and what was accountability. And the same thing in New Zealand there too, you know, those guys hadn't lost a race, you know, so both them and myself, what role I play, you know, you're on a hiding to nothing in one sense if you hadn't got beaten, you know. So, um, but the, the key for that and that part of the reason um, I was employed, not only did I know Alan Cotter, but uh, who was the performance director at the time and um, we'd coxed against one another internationally there too. But, you know, I think, you um, they knew that I'd had experience sort of in the corporate sphere with the awesome foursome with um, uh, having to manage things like sponsors and those sort of things there. So the New Zealand opportunity was not only coaching them but also managing these really popular New Zealand athletes. So with a bit gotcha. of experience of that, you know, I was, I was, I was a reasonable fit for them uh, and I learned a pretty good lesson on day one when I met with Hamish and uh, we sat down. And it was a listen of what the two guys were like because Hamish, the, the, the hierarchy, New Zealand rowing had said, oh, you two guys meet an old, your new coach, you know. So Eric had gone because he sort of had to do a bit of family things with his boy and um, and, and that you learned that on day one, you know, managing life is a big part of a successful athlete as well. But Hamish is very disciplined, determined. He sat and waited for me and um, – told me basically the things that he wasn't good at and if I wanted to, I could try and fix them and every other coach would try to fix them as well too. And he's talking specifically about blade dip. And I said, look, I think for the time being, we'll leave it exactly where it is, you know. Um, if it's not broken, don't try and fix it. But they they were wonderful to work with in um, both a planning sense and a reviewing sense. And I've never met sort of two guys who uh, – and we would – it was very infrequent where you'd sit down and have meetings and those sort of things. They knew what to do. But when we did, we were really strong on what our purpose was and what we wanted to actually do. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to do things differently. They were not going to survive, um, you know, four years doing it the same way as Dick. They said we would give it away 
if if that's the way we went about doing it. So it was about our daily training, but also the season goals we'd set, the activities we'd do and the like there too. So that's why things like they, they rode singles quite a lot in that period of time. Uh, we raced a cox pair one year. Um, uh, we did we did some different things um, throughout the campaign. Rode the cox pair one year. Um, we rode singles quite a lot. We uh, didn't race a World Cup one year, um, and that that was to keep it fresh. And and so, as a coach, you know you you're integrally involved in that sort of planning cycle. Not to say here's the program, go away and do it. You need to have motivated athletes. Yep. And if we were going to also train a little bit less as well too, there's always a danger if you don't train as much that that would have an impact on it. So we had a, a physiologist, you know, Dan Plews, who worked integrally with us in terms of the designing of the training methodology as well. And so that collectively we decided we would do some specific things that would enable them to race um, and have the artillery, no matter what the world's throwing at us, where we could still get through and win. And um, uh, we had some plans about trying to be a little bit quicker in racing. You might have remembered their race strategy was set a bit behind, you know, even split come through. And we'd worked hard on some things there, thinking, well, if someone does, for example, a French pair on you and gets five lengths in front, you never catch them, you know. What's mm-hmm. our role within that? So we sort of did some things there. We thought that and it was... It worked a little bit inversely in terms of our race profiling uh, by doing. We, we even increased our capacity through the middle of the race through the high-end work we'd actually done there too. So you sort of learn lessons, you know, the scientists are learning lessons, they are, we are, all the way through. But um, we had a couple of narrow calls, but in the main they had a pretty good second four years, uh, yep. were probably slightly faster. And they, they did a 6.09 in 2014 and uh, – 608 obviously in in London but their average times were a little bit better so as they got older they got better which is a you know a good credit to any any athlete and the whole program that you know in eight years you're still getting better in your seventh and eighth year absolutely and one of the things that struck me when I read their book was uh, like you said it wasn't all volume 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 I mean they started to figure it out and they did a really good job of uh, listening to their bodies and to one another and the fact that they were going to world championships in uh, Slovenia or Lucerne or whatever, and taking days off, you know, four or five, six days before racing, just to have a beer and relax. <laughs> it's just something that I feel like lots of athletes around the world wish they could do and still go out and dominate a world field like that. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, they knew what the they knew what the end result looked like. Actually, you know, so when we we're away on nine week tours, you know, day one, Eric would come back, and there'd be Tim Tams and Coca Cola and that sort of thing there. By the time you're getting a couple of weeks out there, you know, the diet's changed, everything, and he's healthy, he's lost some weight, and you, you, know, you know when the actual end, re- end result is. You know what to do to get there too. So you've got to sort of tolerate some behaviours. Hamish wasn't always happy about it because he was a bit more straight-laced with, their, with everything there too, but that made it really a strong partnership as well because they were a little, little bit different and um, were prepared to back themselves that at the end of the day they, they'd done the work to, to get through and, so that's great competitors. They wanted to compete every day. That was that was a, the marking of if you don't do the volume, if you do it all really well with quality and with intent, then a lot of the time that will will win the day over you know a lot of wasted um, fluff um, you know, training. So they they weren't interested in, in in that at all. So everything they did was pretty much uh, spot on. Now. After working with the pair, you took on a bit of a role developing and supporting the the Kiwi Men's Eight, which is at the time and it still is one of the coolest and arguably most successful projects in the rowing world. Uh, essentially, taking a group of young athletes, a lot of whom were part of that back to back under twenty three eight that won worlds, uh, and developing them into a senior crew that would go on to compete uh, eventually at Rio. And I know several of the guys are still on the team. Can you tell us a little bit about that project and the role you played? Yeah, I mean, I probably played a bit role. I might, might have played a role as the head coach over there and slowing them down for a little while. But maybe if I look back and try to justify my my role there, I might say I took you backwards to go forwards. Um, <laughs> it's a rowing uh, pun. Um, they, when I f- went my first year, they won under 23 uh, and a fairly young crew uh, with Ian Wright and, and, and won again, you know. So the second year they were – with me in the summer, and then they'd be with Ian in the winter, but they'd be in the training training centre. So I sort of had a bit of an overview of them sort of through that period of time. 
and then Ian left after those uh, two years and, and went to Switzerland. And our intent, because we didn't have a lot of other depth, um, but one of the initial reasons for my involvement in New Zealand rowing was coming from a bigger program in Australia, there was a keen desire through Rowing New Zealand to build the depth and to build the eights programs. And there was a philanthropic program in place to be able to help fund the uh, eights program because it costs a lot more. You know, you've got nine right, athletes and a coach yeah. and e everything magnifies somewhat from Rowing New Zealand and being small boat uh, oriented and um, and therefore your costs are a little bit lower. So with the increased funding that was done really well by the organisation, the opportunity was to send you know, men's and women's crews away. And when you look at particularly the girls, you know, ultimately they probably in the back end had a little bit more success than the boys, even though they got a silver and the boys a gold. The girls had been sort of, you know, up on the dice a, a, a few times. Yep. And then in 2015, we had a really good year, 2015, and um, albeit for a couple of strokes in Egg Billette, we might have got a medal, you know, in their first year senior, seniors. And then that, that gave you obviously automatic involvement in the um, uh, um, Rio Olympics. But that was a tough campaign for them. You know, young guys, first Olympic Games, you know, some, you know, anecdotally a lot of people say you struggle in your first or better in your second and those sort of things there too. And, you know, in fact, we're still in the final. Um, we raced bravely even though we weren't racing all that well and um, and ended up uh, six. But that's still not a bad four years of work for that that a group of guys, and we only had the one change in the boat in that whole uh, four years. Yep. 2017 became a bit of a struggle then. You know, you're trying to repeat, you know, you're trying to get the same guys there. Their, their expectations were really, really high. Uh, and Sean Kirkham, who's been through that boat the whole time now, he does a bit of corporate speaking and that sort of stuff, and he reflects brilliantly in terms of um, – the, the highs and the lows throughout the whole campaign and what you learn by that whole thing. And so, you know, I, I was part of it. We were desperate. I had wonderful support through our national selectors in terms of we were trying everything. Now, I think we made a lot of mistakes, don't get me wrong, sort of in that period, but it probably was also an, an opportunity to springboard. So in 2019, my last year, and then I left to come back to Australia, the, the intent wasn't to row the eight. You know, the guys themselves, you know, they – had a 17, 18, they, you know, it hadn't gone the way they wanted it to go. So they thought in, in 19, we row a four. We had a, you know, some good guys looking like we we're going to have a good four, good pair. Um, we'd won a bronze in 17 uh, with the pair. And, and then 18, we had injuries to both Mike and Tom in that period there too. But in 2019, in walked Hamish Bond. I'm on the, I'm on the comeback trail. You know, he'd been cycling and those sort of things there. And, uh, the eight's the only boat he hadn't succeeded in internationally. Yep. So he said, we're rowing the eight. So it was like, you know, the king, king had walked in the building. So <laughs> All I, right, I, I guess we're rowing the eight. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, of course, you know, um, peers are more influential in terms of the end result of outcomes and what coaches are. You know, we can't of course. think necessarily, you know, and if you get the right peers and they support one another, you know, that, that's a really strong part of it. And... Um, and they, when I left, they appointed Tony O'Connor, which was the most brilliant appointment that they could have done. You know, um, he was he was a standout to sort of do that role, and thankfully, you know, he saw fit to want to actually do that. So he, even Tony, you know, and and they still struggled in two thousand nineteen. And Mahe rode in it as well there too, and and probably fortune follows the brave, and and uh, they then had to qualify the boat, and and with a little bit of extra time. Um, it played quite into their hands to be really ready, uh, highly motivated, all on the one page, which had been a bit of a struggle sort of a little bit earlier. You know, Tony done a great job. The athletes had. Bondi obviously a strong influence in in all of that. And then they rode brilliantly, which everyone will reflect on um, the way they rode. And, of course, people will now want to copy that, you know, and the big boy rhythm and all, all the wonderful stories associated with that. But there was a lot of trials and tribulations throughout the um, – the, the whole journey. What I'm thankful of is that the group that started, some of them were still there at the the end, and I think that's you know a, a role. If you played anything, it was you know through thick and thin, being able to retain some athletes. You know, and a lot of athletes when they don't do as well want to give it away. So absolute full credit to the you know, the guys that just soldiered on year after year, and uh, and and got every bit of reward that they richly deserve for you know, many years of hard work. 
Most certainly. Now, you talk a little bit about some of the mistakes that were made along the way. And without pointing out to one or two of them, you have had a very successful, um, very lengthy coaching career at a variety of different levels. What is a piece of advice that you would give to a young coach looking to hone their craft, potentially working their way up to that international or national level? I, th- I think the key thing is you don't know what you don't know. Um, and if you're not prepared to go out and find that, um, then you're going to struggle. You know, your, your, your artillery of information and knowledge won't be enough because something will trip you up somewhere along the line. It'll be you Inevitably, won't know enough yeah. about training methodology. Um, you'll go down a slightly different or wrong course with a particular crew with a, with a technical model, you know, than what they need to actually do. Um, your communication skills might suffer somewhat. Um you know, you, 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 your knowledge of race strategies in, in compared to your opposition may, may you know, fall a little bit short because you haven't been there and you're confident you're one trick pony and those sort of things there too. So uh, the, the, the key thing is for those who want to aspire to the top is, is to keep learning and to work out what it is you don't know and be brave enough and humble enough to sort of want to go out and actually do it. And um, it, it, I mean, we, we're, we're all taught sort of through the world and well-being these days, you know, reach out, talk, you know, and those sort of things there too. And that's that's the best sort of thing you know, younger up-and-coming coaches can be, you know. Um, there's a few of us still around that can offer advice and guidance, you know. There's a lot of ways in which you can better yourself. And the, the, the real struggle is, you know, if people don't rally around and get support to people around them and who can help them and guide them and advise them and be there for them, then if you think you can do it on your own and you know it all, then... I don't think you last very long. You might get lucky and have a few good athletes at some stage, but the longevity of it, I think, is questioned if you don't keep learning. Well, look, I think that's a fantastic spot to uh, to end our chat. I mean, I appreciate you not only saying this, but acting the way or walking the walk the way you're talking the talk, um, having reached out to you kind of out of the blue, and you've been more than willing to have this conversation and chat with us. So. Thank you very much for taking time out of the morning on your day off to kind of talk us through some of your experiences and, and some of the occurrences along your career. I think people are really going to enjoy the chat. I know I certainly appreciated the connection. So thank you very much. Yeah, it, it drives me on at the moment, Zach. I'm, I'm off to Brisbane tomorrow to um, work with the Australian Institute of Sport at University of Queensland on a coach mentoring program too. So, um, you know, we've, we've got to offer our knowledge back to the, the community too. So um, I'm enjoying that in the twilight of my career. So thanks for reaching out and uh, keep up your good work as well. And well done on your awards. Well, thank you. And I appreciate it again. All the best to you and your crews for the rest of the season. And uh, we'll be in touch shortly. All right. I'm going to be honest with our listeners for a moment. I had dozens of questions for Noel and took a lot of time trying to figure out what to ask him and still feel like with the questions we ask, we only scrape the surface on what he's accomplished and experienced over his incredible five and a half decade career uh, in rowing. He's created fast boats at all levels of competition and has left a significant impression on the athletes he's coached wherever he's been. Furthermore, Noel was quick to respond to me despite my initial contact being a bit of a cold call um, and expressed a number of times kind of off air how he's keen to share his knowledge with the next generation of coaches to further the support and the future of our sport. So I'm exceptionally grateful for for his time and uh and his commitment and contribution to our show today, as well as the sport of rowing as a whole. I know today we were only able to briefly touch on a wide variety of topics with Noel, but I certainly enjoyed the discussion around Coxwins becoming coaches, the success of the Australian Fours, not only recently, but uh, at the start of his career throughout the 90s and the early 2000s. And it kind of goes without saying that anybody in the rowing world likes to get a little insight into the inner workings of the Kiwi pair. So a huge thank you to Noel for his openness um, to share his time and his experiences with us today, especially on his day off. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. It was an absolute pleasure chatting with you and being part of your day. And I hope to see you all back for our next episode when it drops in a couple of weeks time. If you enjoyed this episode, I would ask that you please take a moment and share it with one person in your circle who you think might enjoy it or benefit from some of the topics discussed. Um, it would be great if you could rate the show and subscribe to the Doc Talk channel wherever you get your podcasts. We are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and more. If you have an idea for a future show, would like to recommend a guest, or just want to pass on a comment, question, concern, we take compliments as well. At the, you, can be, you can reach me at the doctalkpod at yahoo.com. Wishing you all a very speedy week. Until next time, this has been Doc Talk.